first uh, actual emphasis on fool is a word that means simple. And it's a very interesting word in Hebrew because it literally means empty or wide open to influence. So the concept here is that somebody is literally vacated their minds. This is the reason why, by the way, I don't use the word vacation. Vacation literally means to vacate, to leave empty. So I don't want my students when they're on holiday to vacate their minds. Uh, so I actually identify the word holiday, holy day, a day set apart. So we remember whatever it is that we're remembering, we're remembering at a certain time for a certain purpose. But this is the first kind of fool that we encounter in the book of Proverbs. Somebody who's simple, somebody who just takes in things without thought because they really have no basis from, wh for, from which to evaluate what they're thinking about. These simple ones literally fall into trouble. So we might actually identify them as simpletons. That is, they always find a way of finding distress in one way or another. They are very indiscriminate shoppers in the uh, marketplace of life. Let me give you an example of this uh, going from the book of Proverbs chapter 9. And we'll check out the uh, statements here in verse 4, for instance. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. Now this is the adulteress who is calling people the simple ones in the public square. And then verses 13 and, and 16, the woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. Now, that's, that's the key here. It's not that the adulteress, the seductress knows nothing. It is that they are vacant of any kind of ethical persuasion. They have no foundation of wisdom from which to evaluate anything. And it continues here where the, the one who has vacated their ethical base, she then says, whoever is simple, the same kind of people as me who are vacant or empty ethically, I want you to come and turn in here, turn into where I'm at. Now, of course, the adulteress could, the seductress could actually mean exactly that. But it is the siren call of any kind of idolatry. The book of Proverbs, remember, gives us metaphors that help us to understand basic concepts of life. So whatever it is that we find idolatrous or we pursue is the key uh, to all of this. So what's the difference between naive and innocent? Are you gullible? Find out for only one dollar. <laughs> I, I found that and I said we got to put that on a slide. You know? uh, one of the key things here uh, between naivete and innocence always comes up uh, whenever I'm teaching these kinds of ideas. Uh, because of Jesus' famous line, uh, we should be as innocent as doves but as wise as serpents. What does it mean to be as innocent as a dove? Well, let's explore the difference between naivete and innocence. Naivete has a sense of smugness about it, like, I don't need you to tell me because I already know. Have you heard that lately, by the way? <laughs> uh, not only perhaps in your home, but perhaps on social media or on television, movies. These folks are ethicless. I don't think I've ever used that mm -hmm. word before, but they are ethicless. They are gullible in the sense that they will take in whatever is current in popular culture. So whatever the thing is that's most being addressed at the moment, this is what they're all about. They're open to anything, therefore, because whatever the culture is going to tell them is key. They know something, but they act on it anyway. They know that, it's, that some people view this as bad or negative in some way, but they're going to do it anyway. Again, does that ring a bell anywhere? I mean, it rings a bell in me, because it's me. <laughs> I, I fall into that own, my own trap in, the, in some of those cases myself. Then we compare this, though, with the innocent. What are we supposed to be? We should be humble people. We should look for virtue, that is, standards uh, whereby we abide. Uh, these standards then make our actions or our, our living unimpeachable, which is the word blameless in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Remember, the elders are supposed to be this way. And we know things, but that doesn't mean that we act on them. So to be innocent, if we could summarize all of this, to be innocent means you know what's going on in culture. Yeah, I get it. I don't want to really think about that any longer because I see it for what it is. The naive person, however, is ethicless and therefore pursues it because 
they like it, they want to be accepted by the culture, whatever the case might be. So here is a guy uh, that people love to hate. This guy's name is Martin Scarelli. He's the CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals. He hiked the cost of Daraprim, the drug used to fight infections in patients suffering from AIDS and other conditions, from $1,350 a pill to $750 a pill, a $5,000 or 5,000% increase. This was just back in February of this year. Perhaps you remember this uh, particular person and the smug look that he has on his face. Don't you just want to go up there and just wipe it off, you know, just smack it off him? I mean, this is how we are viewing the kinds of persons that we're dealing with when we're talking about fools who are ethicless. They are empty-headed without ethics, not without knowledge, however. I mean, this is a really smart guy. He's got a lot of acumen. He knows his way around the business community. He knows the ins and outs, as we say. But he is ethicless. So should we be surprised by these things? Should we be surprised by this man who just stepped down as the president of Wells Fargo? If you've been listening at all to the news in the last week or so, you realize that Wells Fargo tried to uh, create monetary streams by not jacking up their prices in this case, but by creating new accounts. Uh, I don't know quite how you do that without some accountant somewhere figuring this thing out. And then, of course, you have this lady, Ms. Bresch, uh, who was the one who in, was in the middle of the EpiPen scandal where she hiked the prices and so on and then they came in and they said well you can have a twofer for this amount you know she hasn't lost her job yet by the way uh, but these are the kinds of folks that we're dealing with Wells Fargo, EpiPen, Stump and Bresch uh, and this just happened this past month. If ethics are relative simply a matter of the will then we live in an empty-headed culture. Amen. Let me say that again. If ethics are relative simply a matter of the will, then we live in an empty-headed culture. Now, the empty-headedness, remember, is an ethicless culture. That is, we don't have any standards or we don't abide by those standards. Even though we say they're there, we try to find a way around them. This always reminds me, by the way, of the playground, the elementary school playground. You've seen this happen, I'm sure, maybe in your backyard. All the neighborhood kids get together and they make up a game. And then they make up the rules to the game. And as soon as the guy who makes up the rules starts to lose, what, ha what happens? They change the rules. Look, nothing has changed. Everybody thinks, wow, this is really deep theology. No, man, this isn't deep theology. This is just plain old simple human nature. We've been doing this since elementary school. Nothing has changed. And the reason why nothing has changed is because we haven't changed, our natures haven't changed, the problem of the permeation of sin. So the empty-headedness of our culture really is a reflection of people who uh, are basically saying to God, look, we really don't need your standards, your rules. There is no uh, basis for understanding uh, sinfulness in any way. Now, all of this comes from my favorite atheist, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, Nietzsche is my favorite atheist because he said these things. The Christian God is dead. Now you're going to wonder about me if I just <laughs> left that up there. Uh, but then he immediately said thereafter, the Christian ethic is dead. This is why he's my favorite atheist, because he was honest. He said, look, God's dead. But if God's dead, you can't have his ethic either. You can't have love your neighbor as yourself. No, you can't do that, because God is dead. I love that. Be honest with me. Just be straight up, you know? Don't you just wish people would just be honest? That would really be nice. That's why he's my favorite atheist. Now, we are living literally, when I talk about ethics and ethicalness in a culture, an empty-headed culture like we have, we need to talk about the cut flower syndrome. By the cut flower syndrome, I mean this. You all have had this experience where you go to Kroger, let's say and you pick out a nice bouquet of whatever flower arrangement that they have that particular day, and of course you put it in that nice little receptacle plastic bag thing, and you take it home, because these are cut flowers, and then you put them in a vase, and in some way, you know, you put in that little food, you know, for the cut flowers, and they might last for a while, but eventually they die. Why? Because they've been cut off from the root. Look, if 
our culture has cut itself off from a Christian ethic, from a Christian root, then we shouldn't be surprised by a cut flower syndrome. We shouldn't be surprised that ethics continue to erode in a culture such as this. And so we consistently will need to say this, our culture is simple if it thinks life as we know it can continue without an ethical base. This whole thing is going to come crashing down at some point because a culture cannot be sustained without a standard of ethics underneath it. If a culture doesn't actually know what right and wrong is, <laughs> that thing ain't lasting very long. So, this a uh, couple weeks ago, actually, one of the students, I work with students at IUPUI and uh, talk with them about their academic intellectual lives and so on, and this one student uh, said uh, this last week, uh, my law professor said the law changes depending on the culture. Just stop to think about that. The law changes depending on the culture. I, you know, the fa I can't even fathom the implications, well, I can fathom the implications of that. It's, it just unnerves me to actually see it taking place. What will he base his ethics on if judicial rulings are based on the shifting standards of the day? So that's what she asked me. So I said, really, he's only got one option. The hope of every evolutionary development is based on the assumption of human perfectibility. We're going to get better and better. And therefore, if we're going to get better and better, we can rise up. We can create our own ethic. We can have our own standard. We say what is right and what is wrong. Well, of course, as soon as we say we say, then the question becomes, what about those people who don't agree with you? Does, what kind of rights do those, those people get? Well, we don't care about those people anymore, and it quickly... Uh, decomposes literally uh, into a morass of an ethicless culture. So in 2 Timothy 3.7, uh, one of these great lines uh, says, ever learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. There are brilliant people, erudite, ethereal thinking folks who understand great concepts of, the, of life, but they have not come to a knowledge of the truth. And the truth is the foundation and the permeation through which we ought to be thinking about all of life. So let's just give an example of this. If the Constitution is a living, breathing document, let's just consider this possibility for a moment. If the Constitution is a living, breathing document, that means that the winds of cultural change will change it. So we saw that yet again this last year in Obergefell, uh, where we had a decision that where the the federal judiciary said to the states, we don't care about the Ninth and Tenth Amendments any longer, just like they did in 1973, by the way, about the abortion ruling. So the issues that we face are going to continue to look more and more like this in a culture that has an ethicless base, where we say that the original purpose is lost and we really don't care about authorial intent. Uh, this last semester, I think I told you in some other class that I was teaching, uh, that I started to go back to school again, and one of the classes I was in was in a theoretical literature class, that is where do all the theories come from in literature. And uh, I was defending uh, E.D. Hirsch's uh, book, The Validity of Interpretation, which says that authors have an intention, and that intention comes through their book. And my professor looked at me dumbfounded and said, you really believe that? Because they don't believe that. They believe that it's always up to the reader to interpret whatever the text says. Well, guess what? If it's always up to the reader to interpret what the text says, you can make the text say whatever you want, That's right. which is exactly what it ended up happening, you know, consistently. So the same thing is true about biblical truth. If we leave these things up to the whim of the interpreter, to the winds of the cultural opinion, to the wiles of the powerful, we've lost intention, therefore we have lost the basic foundation of ethics and we become and are empty-headed and ethicless. So let's try to reform this if we can, at least for the church, shall we? Uh, when I think about the concept of wisdom, uh, I'm always reminded of the kaleidoscope, because in the first seven verses of Proverbs chapter 1, there are seven words, seven words for wisdom. And these words are knowledge, wisdom, understanding, instruction, prudence, guidance, and, direct, and discretion. And those each have their Hebrew roots, and we'll talk about some of these in the weeks to come. We'll talk about some of them actually today. But these seven words are very important because they run all the way through the book of Proverbs. And they're important because they give us a standard for ethics, for thinking about coming out of our empty-headedness 
and stop being so simple and just taking in whatever we see around us. So it's this kaleidoscope uh, idea here. Let me come back to this picture because it really does represent what this is all about. If you'll see the picture on the right, this kaleidoscope picture, you'll see a center uh, design, and then you'll see six other designs around the outside of the one. I chose that picture in particular because this is exactly what Proverbs 1 to 7 looks like. There is one wisdom word. It's the word is hokma, which is uh, we'll talk about in just a moment. But the concept of hokma then is kind of solidified and and uh, augmented and amplified by these six other words. In fact, if I were going to put it in artistic uh, sense, I would say each of these words gives their own hue, their own color to wisdom. And so we'll see that as we uh, unpack some of these words uh, this week and in the weeks to come. So here's our word, hokma, uh, and it literally, this is where I get the salvation with work clothes on. This, uh, throughout the, uh, the scriptures, means a number of different things. It means the biblical skill to live life, and I've just li listed a whole bunch of ways in which scripture uses this, in technical, artistic, governmental, warfare, diplomacy, judicial management, problem solver, and coping skills. All of these ideas are referenced within Hokma, the, the concept of wisdom. Just to give you one example out of that, that whole list there. In Exodus chapter 31, there's this great uh, understanding of where artists get their, uh, their best results from. There's a guy by the name of Bezalel in Exodus chapter 31, and he's the guy who makes the accoutrements of the temple, all the furniture stuff. And it says there that he's been given his chokhmah, his skills, by the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's kind of cool. You know the first people filled with the Holy Spirit in the First Testament were artists. I'll just let that hang in the air. <laughs> I think artists are pretty cool, and I think that idea is pretty cool that God used that first with artists. So artistic skill, the skill to live, and the skill that we have represented in this room, for instance, is multifaceted. You all have skills in one way or another that can be amplified and emphasized to, to show that God has established this in all of uh, the giftedness he's given to us. Solomon, of course, the great example, 1 Kings chapter 4, 29 to 34, uh, where it says that he has uh, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. This is what he wanted. He asked for God gave it to him. And this is the reason why, when you read 1 Kings 9 and 10, you see all the people from the surrounding lands coming to talk to Solomon about his wisdom. Because he had it. So you remember just the Queen of Sheba, for instance. That's just one example of what's going on in 1 Kings 9 and 10. Everybody's coming to check out his wisdom. And I wonder, as I even say that this morning, are people coming to check us out? Do people come to us for our wisdom? Do people seek us out for one thing or another? Maybe it could be as simple as, hey, you know what, I've, been, I've noticed something different about you. I've been having this problem at home. I thought of anybody in the office, you might understand. That's hokma. That's a skill that you've been given by God that demonstrates an ethic that somebody else doesn't have. And that's what it means to live in biblical wisdom. So what are we supposed to do with this wisdom? Well, all the way through Proverbs, we see the same kind of pattern. We are to seek it, we're to find it, we acquire it, we enable it, and then we protect it. All five of those concepts, seek, find, acquire, enable, and protect, are crucial to wisdom. Because we don't ever want to lose it, we want to maintain it, but we also want it to be amplified and grow within our own lives. And all of those uh, concepts are really imperative for us. So let's talk about wisdom as it's inseparable from knowledge. Let me take us to uh, back to this first uh, section of the book of Proverbs and underline and highlight uh, what Proverbs 1 is emphasizing. So in Proverbs 1, 2, it says, To know wisdom and instruction. That's our word knowledge or instruction here. These two things are put in tandem for a reason. In fact, they show up later on in these seven verses, also in tandem for a good reason. Wisdom, as we've already expressed in, in weeks past, emphasizes our relationship with God that's essential and crucial. In fact, there's a parallelism with wisdom that's especially important. Knowledge is not just what's in our heads, but it's action based on revelation. 
So our lives are being lived out literally in front of other people because God's ethic, his standard, his wisdom has been in, uh, in placed and imprinted on us uh, because of our beliefs. So there is something special about the person who walks in knowledge. His relationship with the Lord sets him apart from others. It's a really important word in Hebrew, uh, which highlights this uh, concept of the fear of the Lord. Nowhere else in Hebrew vocabulary do you see the linking of knowing and doing at the same time in one word. But you see it in this word knowledge. So if we could think differently about the word knowledge in our own culture, the word knowledge in our culture is very different than knowledge in the Hebrew concept. So remember what does 2 Timothy 3, 7 say? Ever learning, ever gaining knowledge, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. And that's really a, a crucial concern because people don't necessarily do what they already know. So let me give you some examples of what does this mean? What does knowing mean uh, and knowledge mean in real senses? So perhaps you, you're familiar with this book, Number of the Stars by Lois Lowry, uh, Nazi Occupation of Denmark. And there's a great chapter in this book uh, where this uh, little Christian girl who is trying to save her Jewish friend uh, takes this Star of David and she, she grasps it in her hand. And it literally leaves an impression on the palm of her hand of the Star of David. Well, a teacher, a fourth grade teacher, was reading this book to her kids. And this is what happened. The day she read that particular chapter, she had brought into class a chain and a star of David, similar to the one described in the book. As she read the chapter, she had the students pass the chain around the class. While she was reading, she noticed one student after another pressed the star into her palm, making an imprint. What had they learned from the reading of this book? The reading of this book had changed them internally, so that now it wasn't simply a knowledge of this uh, situation that happened in Denmark in World War II, but they began to, to feel and intuit, and literally it, it became a core of their being, so much so that they wanted to do exactly what the book said. Isn't that cool? So when we talk about knowledge, knowledge and wisdom is internalization of God's ethic, the internalization of God's word. I remember when uh, I took my daughter, and this was a long time ago, She's 30 now, and this happened when she was 12. Uh, one of my speaking trips, I went to Washington, D.C. We were looking at the monuments. We went into the Lincoln Memorial. And if you take a right-hand turn after you see Abe, uh, you're going to go into a portico that has uh, this wonderful etching of the second inaugural address. And you see some of it here on the board. And what was really fascinating to me that day, and of course, as a father, you know, you kind of well up with pride about these kinds of things, about good things that your kids do, she began to read this thing out loud. There were about 50 people in that little area, 50 people. She just starts reading this thing out loud, and everybody stops talking and listens to this little girl who's reading one of the great character speeches of all time in American history. You see, Abraham Lincoln was one of these people who had internalized wisdom. He had internalized knowledge. It had become a part of him. The ethic was etched in his fibers of his being. Same with MLK. A quarter million people showed up on a hot August afternoon to listen to MLK give this speech. I have a dream. And the whole point of his speech is about character, what, com what comes from within. MLK is the kind of guy who says, hey, look, you know, I know we look different from each other on the outside, but what really should matter is what comes from the inside, and that was, that was his emphasis. Really an important and powerful speech. And by the way, if you really want to influence young people, uh, I highly recommend reading them stories like Number of the Stars and reading them speeches like MLK's speech or Lincoln's second inaugural. This is one of the reasons why I think it's wrong for us to emphasize rewards with our children. Because rewards simply focus on the external of life. Instead, what we ought to be after is changing the internality of a person's person. So the reward really only gets us more rewards. Why do we do what we want to do? Because we're going to get another candy bar, whatever the case might be. 
I've written long and hard against rewards, and usually when I speak to educational conferences, it's the thing that gets me in the most trouble. <laughs> I get in trouble all the time, but this is one that really gets me in trouble, especially with elementary school teachers, as you might imagine. <laughs> intentional character development through intentional introduction. What should we be doing? We should be introducing young people to the great people of the past, like Harriet Tubman or Booker T. Washington. When we introduce them to great people, they begin to aspire to a whole new model, a whole new mentorship, a whole new discipleship, simply by being introduced to the individuals in history that have made such a powerful difference. And when I think about intentional character development, I also think about gender differences. Now, I know that even saying that today is, you know, anathema in our culture, but, you know, this is a Presbyterian church, and we actually believe in the Bible as the basis for authority, so I'll continue. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll notice there's this uh, little example of who says women can't be doctors. I found a website last month called A Mighty Girl. That's it, a mighty girl, all one word, dot com. And uh, I found this site, and I started reading some of the books and, and examples and historic uh, uh, per personages listed here, and I began to say, this is my granddaughter. So if you want to know about what I think about my granddaughter and how she reflects a mighty girl, go to my website, warpandwoof.org, and the last couple weeks, that one of my essays is on women. And I highlight seven women from First Testament teaching about the great examples that they left to us and uh, the kinds of uh, examples they're leaving for a young girl like Marilyn, and for all girls for that matter. And then about boys, I want to say this about boys. A great uh, book here, uh, mirroring Charlotte Mason's uh, teaching in education. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Charlotte Mason or not. A great homeschool uh, focus and, and real foundation for homeschool folks. But Charlotte Mason believed, as I do, that little boys probably shouldn't go to school before they're 9 or 10. Yeah, I know, that's going to really step on toes this morning, too. But nonetheless, the point of the, the issue for Charlotte Mason and for educators is sometimes we overreach and we try to make things happen that maybe should be left to time. And so uh, these are some things to consider. How are we going to impact the character of our children? This is the real issue. So, this last week, uh, I was in Philadelphia, uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I was teaching a course on leadership. And a PhD course, I had a number of students, if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see us, a picture of us together. Uh, and one of the things I had them do is I had them read this book, Shame. Now, what was really fascinating about this was their response to shame. They loved it. They, at first, when they told me, uh, when we first were given this assignment for you to read, sh us to read Shane in a PhD course, we all went, you got to be kidding us. But they said, it's better than all the boring leadership books that we've ever read. <laughs> because there are constant themes of leadership that run through the book of Shane, uh, which is really important, I think, and powerful. And one of the key attributes of Shane in his character development is this idea that he has restraint. He doesn't have to respond to every slight. He doesn't have to respond to every acoustic remark that he has to endure. He doesn't even have to respond to the physicality of life in the way that we think maybe uh, somebody that used to be a gunslinger and becomes a gunslinger again uh, actually might want to do. So my question for us here in this slide is, are we driven by cultural injunction, institution, movements, or emotionalism? Or do we demonstrate restraint in this? So, I have to tell you this story because it's very, it's fresh. <laughs> Last night I was sitting in a chair uh, watching people in an airport in Philadelphia, international airport. And uh, Robin calls me, for those of you not, no, no, Robin's my wife. And uh, Robin calls me and, and she says, have you seen it yet? And I said, seen what? And she said, well, Somebody's going after you on social media, and they're saying pretty nasty stuff about you. I just wanted you to, to warn you about it so that you didn't see it. So um, I decided... Now you can't look, right? <laughs> yeah, well, and I, so I decided because of the situation that I'm just not, I'm going to let it go. Um, 
mostly because Robin told me to. <laughs> Sometimes the best restraint I have is the one, you know, that, uh, that lives with me. Um, so really, I, I give you this example of restraint, not because it's something that uh, is powerful within me, because quite frankly, I'd like to write a dissertation in response, you know, that would be my normal ploy. Um, but in this particular case, it's probably best not to respond. Now, this is coming from my wife, who really thinks that this is the best course of wisdom, because she has chokhmah, she has wisdom. And because of this, uh, she then is going to help me to think differently about things. I tell you that little story without a lot of elaboration or detail to emphasize that this is exactly what wisdom is like in just one small little piece of life. Restraint. But it's one of many things that we could apply this to. It just happens to be the one that's happened to me most recently. So, as always, I leave us with questions. And, of course, you can ask your own if you're so inclined. When do I act the fool? Is that ever part of who I am? How do I fall into, the, into empty headedness? Why is intentionality important in ethical choice? And that goes back to my questions about the Bible's intention and the Constitution and so on. How does wisdom inform my character? And then what specific traits should biblical wisdom impact in me? We will continue this discussion, of course, uh, in the weeks to follow, but this kind of sets our course, at least for this week. Thoughts, comments, questions?